Hello and welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Ben Mushko. Um, I work as one of the Gradle engineers um, and we do a lot of core development as well, well as helping clients moving on from and the Maven to Gradle. And what we see um, these days that we not only help uh, clients uh, move on with their build, build infrastructure, but as well as with their actual infrastructure that they have in place, hardware. And they also want to have a look at a virtualization of this hardware. So in this talk, I want to uh, focus on how we can create and manage um, virtual machines, as well as virtualized full application runtime environments with the help of Gradle. How can we trigger these tools? Uh, we'll focus on certain tooling. Um, and in this talk, we'll talk about uh, Vagrant uh, for creating virtual machines and Docker uh, to create containers. So pretty much self-contained application runtime environments. Um, later on in this talk, we'll also have a look at the build pipeline that you might have in place in your project. Um, that build pipeline usually requires certain environments. And we'll have a look at how we can use virtualization um, to create environments, bootstrap them uh, for automated functional testing as well as exploratory testing. So how does life usually look like without any kind of automation in that field? Um, usually pretty painful. Um, so when we talk about an application environment, we usually um, have to have an up and running application environment as we speak. Um, so usually would say we need to have certain uh, applications, services, data uh, until we actually can deploy our application. And that's what we usually call the infrastructure. So if we don't have any automation in place, um, we have to usually talk to some sort of sysadmin, IT personnel, uh, they go ahead and say, uh, yeah, I need some time to install whatever you give me. Um, so for example, you upgrade from Tomcat 7 to 8. That works just fine in your local development environment. But at some point of time, it has to cross that boundary. You have to put it into place in QA, in staging, UAT, and ultimately in production as well. Um, so it usually goes that way. Um, you uh, create some documentation, what needs to be installed. Hopefully, it's complete uh, and sufficient. Uh, you hand it over to your um, IT personnel, uh, they put it into place, sometimes something goes wrong, you have to go back and forth, make sure that it's correct, and that's simply not sufficient for especially changing any configuration in production, for example. So how can we improve this kind of situation here? Uh, so first of all, um, we have two concepts here. Um, virtualization uh, can be used to um, fully automate a virtual machine on top of a physical machine, meaning we can install multiple OSs and environments uh, on a physical machine. Uh, pretty handy if you want to share resources in general. Um, usually an, uh, a virtual machine is created with the help of an image, and the image is basically just a binary file that you can share, that you can uh, version, uh, that you can put into some sort of repository. Um, oftentimes, these images are publicly available, so you can simply say, uh, give me an image for Ubuntu 12, use that as the base image, and then add additional configurations on top. And that configuration, for example, could say, um, install a specific JDK, for example, JDK 7, um, I need my Tomcat in this case, I need the NoSQL database. So all this stuff uh, can be defined as code as well, and that's when we talk about infrastructure as code, and there's specific tooling that helps you define uh, this configuration. For example, Puppet, Chef, Salt is one of the newcomers there in that field. So it's certainly helpful that pu uh, to put that uh, into a specific type of code. Uh, so in this case, you can treat it as application code, um, which is pretty helpful. You can version it. Uh, so what are typical use cases? Um, for virtualization and infrastructure as code in general. Um, I talked about one uh, where you want to make sure that uh, all environments look the same based on a certain configuration. But also in your local development environment, typical use case, you have a new developer coming on board. How long does it usually take to uh, bring them up to speed? They have to install IntelliJ, Eclipse, JDK, whatever. And of course, you have to have the documentation right. So if something goes wrong, uh, it costs time and resources, so that's something that we can avoid here as well. So no more that just works on my machine, but not on yours, great. Um, so we want to avoid that kind of stuff. Um, another situation um, 
a client comes into your um, company, they want to see a demo of your application, and you don't necessarily want to touch uh, the already existing environments. So you want to say, I have a, want to have a separate environment just to show this demo. Uh, it should be easy to create that demo. Um, you don't want to ask your IT personnel uh, a week before that just to make sure we have that environment in place at that point of time. And it's pretty easy to create these uh, demo environments with the help of virtualization as well. So you simply create a new environment with the help of an image. You have predefined configuration. That's one of the other use cases here. Um, already, I already talked about the environment parity. So you want to make sure that a specific conf a configuration is propagated across all your environments. Um, so not only do you want to make a change to QA, staging, production, uh, you want to make it across the board um, in a unified kind of way. And in the context of continuous delivery, uh, we not only want to test that any change to our application is uh, tested, we also want to go the other way around, that any change that we make to our, uh, our environment actually might potentially have an impact on the application behavior. Uh, it might introduce a bug. It might not even run with Tomcat 8 anymore, and we want to figure that out. So these are typical use cases here. But what are the benefits? So I already mentioned one benefit here, um, proper configuration management. So you can define this configuration, put it into version control, you can tag it, you have a track record of what has changed over time, who has changed it, you can share it with your other developers and work on it as you usually do with the application code. In this case, I'm showing Git. Um, it doesn't have to be Git. It can be any version control system, so it doesn't really matter. And don't get confused about the little Ruby, uh, Ruby icons here. I simply use that because some of the tooling historically uses Ruby as the definition language. But it could be any type of configuration. It could be a flat text file. So once we have that infrastructure in place and we have it in some sort of um, source code repository, it's fairly easy to create new virtual machines or full environments with the help of this configuration. So you can create a new VM for your demo, you can create a new VM for new environments that you have in place, and all of them look the same. Uh, so pretty handy uh, to do that. And also, um, if you wanted to make any change, so you want to play around with a specific environment, you can always start from the base image, make a manual changes to that base image uh, and then you can decide whether that works for you. You can bake a new image, put it into your repository, or you can simply say, I'm going to dump it. Uh, that's, for example, the use case. If you just create an image for, let's say, the demo, afterwards you want to dispose it. Uh, you don't actually need it anymore. And it's very cheap to actually create these new images uh, or machines from these images. So if people come to this kind of concept and techniques, um, they might ask themselves, well, there are all these tools around. Um, what is the major difference between uh, virtual machines and containers? So everybody these days talks about Docker. Um, and they might ask themselves, so what's the major difference between Vagrant and Docker, or generally virtual machines? So in Vagrant, or generally with virtual machines, you have a single physical machine. Um, you have a single uh, host OS. Um, that could be Windows, Linux, Unix, what have you. But on top of that uh, host OS, you create multiple virtual machines. And each of these virtual machines can have their own individual uh, operating system. Not only can you add this operating system, you can also install applications, services, data, specific things that you need. And that could look different uh, from this virtual machine to this one. And you can share the resources, so it's pretty handy. If we talk about Vagrant specifically, um, the typical use case would be to create an image for a local development environment. I just talked about this in the beginning. So if new developers come on board, uh, you can bring up a new virtual machine in your development environment, which almost looks production-like. Uh, so that's kind of handy. You can use the same configuration <laughs> and build a new virtual machine on your environment. You leave it running for the whole day, can do something with it. You can pause it, stop it, or shut it down. Uh, that's pretty much up to you. Um, keep in mind that uh, bringing up these virtual machines might take some time. So boot up time can be high, uh, depending on your configuration. Um, when we look at something like Docker, um, it looks slightly different. Um, so we have one operating system, and that usually in the case for Docker, that's only Linux-based. So it's an OS-level uh, virtualiz virtualization where we share certain binaries, libraries, 
Um, and then we can create specific containers from images uh, that we want to have. Um, this approach is much faster, so you can boot up machines in an instant, so pretty quick. Um, you don't have to wait long. Uh, one more difference between these um, uh, types, I would say, is that in this case, you can actually SSH into the box. So you can treat it like a remote server. You can go into the box, do something, whereas this one uh, doesn't provide that. It's a self-contained runtime environment, so it should have all application services and data baked in, if possible. So let's have a look at Vagrant and what you need to get running. So first of all, Vagrant, um, you need to install the Vagrant runtime. You can simply download it, pretty simple. Um, it provides the uh, virtual machine configuration that you can provide and bootstraps your virtual machine. And what they usually provide by default is, um, say, uh, a one provider here, a virtual box. Um, that's the default, but you can change the provider at any time. So you can say, I want to use AWS or VMware Fusion. Um, that's pretty much up to you, but that's the default standard, easiest way to get started. Once you have that, uh, you can basically uh, bring up a virtual machine with a specific configuration. Just to give you a brief overview over the architecture that uh, Vagrant provides here. Uh, so we can see uh, there's a Vagrant file. Um, actually, it's kind of blurry, so we don't really see um, the outline, but that's okay. So the Vagrant file basically defines um, what you need in terms of an image. So the image could say, use uh, Ubuntu 12 as the image. That should be the operating system. It also provides you with a way uh, to basically expose networking um, kind of things. For example, st a static IP, uh, whatever you need in terms of uh, exposing specific services. And it also provides a pointer to a specific provisioner. And that provisioner is basically invoked when you run Vagrant. Um, based on the provisioner you choose, and that could be Puppet, Chef, a shell script even, um, certain configuration is executed. And that's pretty much the configuration you would put into your version control system as well. So we can see when we bring up a virtual machine, uh, we pull down a specific box, uh, and the box is pretty much the image that we want to use, the base image which usually defines the operating system. Um, you can also add uh, multiple images on top of an image. Uh, so you can say, I want to have a base image which not only provides Ubuntu, but specific services, um, let's say our Tomcat or JDK, and put it in a specific repository. Uh, by default, they have a public repository which is called Vagrant Cloud. Um, it provides some shared images that might be helpful for your environment, but you can also share your own boxes here. Um, and when you run Vagrant, it pulls down that specific box, puts it locally onto your disk. Um, and of course, um, it feels like dependency management in Gradle. It only pulls it down once. Uh, if it already has it locally, then don't pull it down again. So it's a one-time operation. And then it basically uh, executes the virtual machine. Any co configuration is applied, and it brings up the whole operating system, include, including the configuration that you need. So if you wanted to get started just on the command line with Vagrant, it's pretty simple. Um, you say Vagrant in it, and then you give it the name of the box that you want to use. So in this case, that represents Ubuntu 12. That's the name that they uh, give here, Precise64. What that does, it creates a Vagrant file for you out of the box with some default configuration, which you can change at any time. Um, then you can say Vagrant up. So it looks for the Vagrant file that you have in place and evaluates the logic. So if you don't add any additional logic, for example, installing specific services, it will simply just bring up the operating system. So once this is up and running, you can actually do something with the box. So you can SSH into it, uh, pretty handy. You can treat it like a remote server uh, and do whatever you need in your development environment. So you can uh, bootstrap the, kind, the same kind of logic from a Gradle build script. Um, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, we created a Vagrant plugin for that. Um, and I already mentioned it in my other talk uh, that there's a good practice how certain uh, plugins can be composed. Uh, so usually what we want to do, we want to separate capabilities from conventions. Um, so there's a Vagrant plugin uh, that's kind of the, the I would say, a standard uh, plugin that you can 
uh, best get started with. Uh, so it provides standard tasks out of the box, um, for example, for bringing up Vagrant, for destroying a virtual machine, these kinds of things. Um, it configures default conventions out of the box. And it exposes DSL to point to specific boxes that you might want to start or configure other uh, kinds of things. So if you, all, uh, if you didn't want to use the conventions that we provide you as that plugin, uh, we can always say go back to the Vagrant base plugin. Um, it provides certain capabilities. And in this case, the capabilities are custom task types. So the default tasks that we use in this guy here as well, except that we actually create an instance of it in our build. Um, and it also validates the Vagrant installation. So before we can actually start Vagrant, uh, we should probably validate that. That's also configurable. configurable. Uh, but that's pretty much what the base plugin uh, provides you. Um, always a good start with a Vagrant plugin. Um, and if you need more specific logic, go back to the Vagrant base plugin. And we'll also see two examples that show um, how we use them. So first of all, let's have a look at the convention plugin. So the convention plugin, um, <coughs> Only, the only thing you actually need to run it and use it in your build is that you have to define it as, um, as part of your class path for your build script. So we simply say, add this specific jar file that we pull currently from jcenter. Uh, it's currently not available from Maven Central. But it's just a different repository that's out there. Then we apply the specific plugin with the identifier Vagrant to the uh, build script. And then we also configure um, where Vagrant should actually look for um, the Vagrant file. So in this case, we actually use the DSL already that is exposed by the plugin that lets you configure certain things. So in this case, we point it to the box di directory. All you need to do then to bring up Vagrant is to invoke the default task. And that is called uh, Vagrant up. So that fully brings up the Vagrant machine, um, starts all services, evaluates a Vagrant file, whatever we saw before. Pretty similar to what we did on the command line. So if you say, I don't want to use the um, convention uh, tasks, we actually want to create our own tasks here. We can always fall back to the base plugin. And in this case, we say, we actually want to create our own names uh, for tasks that we create in the context of Vagrant. So we say, um, in this case, we want to use uh, VMware Fusion as the provider instead of um, the VirtualBox provider. Uh, we give it specific descriptions, a group. We point it to a specific box directory, and we can stop it and start it. Up there, you can see we have extra properties defined in our build script, uh, which we can share here. And you can see we point it to the actual provider name, and the provider name can be looked up on Vagrant itself. It's a specific configuration for Vagrant. And we point it to the box directory, which is called Fusion Box. So pretty simple. But once we have it brought up, we actually want to do something with that box. Uh, otherwise, it's relatively useless. Um, if you want to automate anything um, as a workflow, you can. So you could, for example, say, bring up the virtual machine first, execute a SSH command within that virtual machine, and then stop the virtual machine again. So in this case, um, there's another custom task that we can use, which is called Vagrant SSH, which automatically runs a SSH command against that uh, virtual machine. And we can see here, uh, we use depends on finalized by to make this part of a workflow. So whenever you run Vagrant echo here, it will actually bring up the machine first. We'll wait until it's up and fully running. Then we run the SSH command. And afterwards, we clean up the resources and destroy the virtual machine again. So you might ask yourself, what if I wanted to pass anything into um, the Vagrant file? And if you look at the Vagrant uh, forums, there's one uh, specific way they want you to do it. Uh, that's with the help of environment variables. Um, there's no other way as far as I know. Um, but we also provide support for that. Um, so no problem here. So we can use the DSL to specify specific key value pairs. Um, and in this case, we want to say we want to expose a static IP for a virtual machine so we can actually uh, call it later on with the help of smoke tests, functional tests, or we can simply call our services from the browser. So that's pretty handy. It's that configuration block here. It's called environment variables. And you would have 
one or many of these variables here. If you then want to use it uh, within the vagrant file, and that's one example here, um, you see there's a specific um, expression here, which we call, uh, which is called env. And there we simply use the key that we have defined here. So that would be replaced with the specific IP address at runtime. Pretty simple. So once you have an up and running uh, machine, you might also want to run smoke tests uh, just to make sure that all the services that you had configured are up and running. Um, you can write these smoke tests as part of your build script as well, um, and that's fairly simple to do. Um, usually what I recommend if you write, write different types of tests other than unit tests, have them defined as a specific source set. So you can then later on have uh, dedicated compile tasks in your build. And in this case, we call this directory smoke test. You can see um, there's a subdirectory called groovy. So we keep um, smoke tests separate from the unit tests in this case here. Um, you might uh, figure that, well, we probably write our tests in groovy. And uh, that's what we are going to show in the next slide here. Uh, just to give you some more uh, idea of how to set up the source test and a dedicated test task. So in this case, we simply use the uh, source sets container. It's a default capability by the Java base plugin. We define our own source set with that specific name, which is smoke test. Uh, we point it to the specific directory which has our test files. They could be JUnit based, testng, what have you. And then we set specific um, compile and runtime class paths that we need for running our smoke tests. So if you wanted to run your smoke tests independently, um, I would usually create a new test task. So a new task of type test, not the default one. Uh, here we basically say what should be the class path for running our tests, which are basically coming from the smoke test source set definition. And we can also pass in specific system properties that we might need at runtime. For example, uh, we want to figure out uh, what the IP address of the virtual machine should be. So we simply pass it in a system property. Or we want to say, what's the port of Tomcat that we want to call? So these kinds of things can be provided. Keep in mind, um, every um, task of type test creates a new uh, forked JVM. Um, so you run them separately from the uh, JV, uh, Gradle JVM process. And in this case, we provide these system properties to that new JVM process. So up here, you can see you can uh, define these as extra properties, pass them in. So that's fairly simple. Um, at some point of time, you actually might, to, uh, might want to externalize this configuration. That's a good way of doing these kinds of things as well. So up here, we see one example. Um, how we use uh, specific dependencies that we use for our smoke tests. In this case, uh, we use HTTP client to make HTTP calls against an up and running Tomcat container. Um, I found HTTP client to be pretty stable and very usable. Um, so I would highly recommend having a look at that guy. And you can see here also that we use the Spark framework as the testing framework for, uh, for our smoke tests. You can basically use whatever testing framework you want. It doesn't really matter. It could be JUnit or TestNG. Um, currently, I'm speaking out of the context of a JVM uh, context. Uh, but if you use something else, that's just fine. You could even run it as curl commands if you want to and do something. So that really depends. Um, in this case, um, must run after depends on finalized by are your best friends if you want to define a specific workflow and a specific task order that you want to enforce. So of course, you want to make sure that the smoke tests are only run after we actually bring up the virtual machine. That's what we define up here. And then we can use task dependencies to say, bring up the virtual machine first, run smoke tests, and in the end, destroy the virtual machine again. So that's a full workflow here uh, that you can use out of the box. It's fairly simple to uh, define this in your build as well. Um, just to give you a, a idea how these tests might be defined um, when I write them with Spark. Um, here we see a specific Spark test. So we have this BDD kind of notation here uh, where we first say when we define um, a specific get URL call, and that is basically defined up here in that abstract class. So I basically move this up one level. Um, we want to make uh, certain assertions here. 
So when we say, if we run that get call with a specific URL, and that URL is provided here in a data-driven kind of way, um, that's a Spark feature, we assert that we get back a HTTP 200, and certain things should happen on top of that. So that's actually fairly simple to define. And of course, you can add multiple URLs here. Uh, that's just one way of defining this in Spark. And to give you an idea how the, the abstract class looks like for making the HTTP calls, that's fairly simple as well. Uh, you can actually see that we extend from specification, specification, which is a Spark class here. And then we create a HTTP client instance. Uh, we can provide specific retry parameters or socket timeouts, just to make sure, because it could potentially take a while until your services are up and running after you start the VM. And then we make a HTTP get call, in this case, execute that call, and then at the end, close the HTTP client again. Um, so what if you also wanted to deploy your application as part, a part of your development process? So you could say, um, again, create a new task of type Vagrant SSH, uh, give it some sort of description, this is optional, but then basically use pull deployment to get your artifact from a specific binary repository. This could be part of your, um, of your build pipeline, or you could have this locally. You can also point it to some sort of other resource, like a shared drive, kind of depends. But this is how we can make it happen as a full workflow. So we start the VM, deploy our application, uh, run the smoke test, which I actually don't show here, and then at some point of time, we can stop the VM again. So that's a full workflow that you can uh, implement in your project. Of course, you also want to run automated functional tests, and they should be part of your process as well, not only smoke tests, which basically just check whether the endpoints are OK or whether certain databases are up, these kinds of things. You actually want to run, smoked, uh, you want to run functional tests to test whether your application is ready from a user's perspective. So you would run through typical use cases, for example, uh, log in a user, um, add something to the shopping cart, uh, check out and then assert something. So these kinds of things can be defined. And this would certainly look different from uh, web applications to desktop applications. So it kind of depends on what framework tooling you want to use. So in web applications, you might want to use Selenium, something like that. Um, JAP is also a nice layer, which I'm actually going to show you in this one. So here you can see, um, again, we assume that we already set up a new source set for functional tests. And here we create a new task of type test uh, where we use that source set, and the name is functional test, to assign the class path, um, set specific uh, report directories. Uh, again, we can certain, uh, certainly pass in specific system properties again. And again, your best friends are must run after, it depends on to enforce a specific task execution order. Um, so that is all possible. And you can make this part of your build as well. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover on Vagrant. Um, let's go over to Docker and see what we can do here as well. So when we have a look at the brief um, architecture of Docker, we can see there's something similar to a Vagrant file, which is in this case called a Docker file. It pretty much has the instructions of what you want to configure uh, for your container or for that specific image. So that could say, uh, pull uh, Tomcat from a specific location, um, install it in that location, and so on. Um, from that Docker file, you can create new images as part of your build, or even from the command line, uh, if you just call plain Docker, the Docker command line uh, tool. Um, you have another option to simply just uh, avoid using a Docker file. So you can simply say, I have a pre-baked image that I want to simply use. Um, as part of my build, or in this case, that I want to create a con container from. Uh, and that image could be part of your local repository or a remote repository. So that sounds kind of like, like Git. So we have a remote repository that you can pull certain images from. We can push up new images as well. And we have a local repository that we can build new images and add them to it, and later on uh, publish them. The end goal here is to use one of these images. Um, 
which are usually self-contained runtime environments, um, and create a container from them. So that's the end goal. That's your running container. So if you wanted to get started with Docker, it's also fairly simple. So you install Docker uh, on your machine. And that usually has to be Linux. Um, there's a wrapper around it, like a virtual machine wrapper if you're on Mac. So that's possible as well. Uh, it's called boot to Docker. Um, that's just another option. Uh, but once you have it installed, um, you can say, uh, pull a specific image from a repo. In this case, that image is called BusyBox. And then you can do something with that box. You can run it and uh, execute specific commands in it. So fairly simple here. Uh, what if we wanted to integrate the same or similar functionality into our Gradle build? Um, we can do that as well. And there's a plugin for that one as, as well. Um, so we can say, pull that specific plugin from JCenter again. Has specific coordinates that we can use. And you can see uh, the version is 0 0.1, so <laughs> pretty early stage. We apply the plugin with the um, identifier Docker. And then we use the DSL again to define a specific server URL. And in this case, you might ask yourself, well, why do I have to define a server URL? Uh, didn't I install Docker on my local machine? Um, what Docker also provides is a remote API. Uh, so you can say, um, I'm going to install Docker on a totally different machine than my local machine, but it can still trigger the commands uh, remotely over a RESTful HTTP client. So that's what we're doing here. So we say we want to actually build images. We want to run containers on a remote machine. Um, of course, you could also point this to localhost. So that's an option. So you can either run it on your local machine or a, against a specific uh, remote server. So how do you actually build such an image? Um, so um, the Gradle plugin gives you some custom task types again. Uh, one of them is called Docker Build Image. It exposes two properties here. And one of these properties is an input directory uh, that pretty much points to the directory which has the Docker file. And of course, this Docker file can be part of your build again uh, that we basically, for example, created dynamically on the fly. Uh, sometimes you might want to say, hey, I want to include this art artifact that I'm currently creating with, with my build, and I'm going to point it to it. Or you can addi add additional things um, as you go, or have a predefined Docker file. Um, with every, every Docker image, you have to give it some specific identifier, um, what they call a tag here. And my tag is simply my app here. Uh, and with that, if you run that, you create a new image um, that is created by the configuration provided by the Docker file. And this is one example of such a Docker file, just to give you an impression how this looks like. Uh, down here, we say from Ubuntu. So obviously, it's a Ubuntu machine or runtime environment. Uh, we can run specific um, commands here. So we can say apt-get and these kinds of things, whatever you need in your virtualized uh, environment. And then ultimately, uh, we potentially also want to run that image. So we not only want to create new images, we also want to create containers from it. And for that, there are, again, custom tasks, uh, pretty simple. So one is called Docker create image, uh, create container, sorry. And that depends on the task that we had defined beforehand, uh, which was called build my app image. So first, we create the image. And then we basically create a new container for that specific image. And the container represents the runtime environment that we can start and stop. So in this case, we say we want to start it. We also want to stop it at some point of time. But how do we actually define such a container? Um, so Docker um, hands you back a container ID when it creates that container uh, from a specific image. Um, and with that, we basically access that container ID once we run this task. This is just an exposed method of a specific task, uh, which is part of the Docker create container um, implementation. So you can always get access to it. So we can always ask it for the container ID, which we then use to start and stop a specific container. So let's have a look at virtualization. Yep. Um, there are at least two Docker plugins, yours yep. and the other one. Yep. Um, care to talk about kind of the pros and cons? Yeah. So the, the, so my one basically only uses the remote API. Under the covers, it uses a Java library, which is called Docker Java, which pretty much just wraps um, 
the HTTP calls and the RESTful calls, uh, so I don't ha actually have to do too much work there. It exposes pretty much all commands that you can think of. One thing is missing, it's called push, so for pushing an image, um, it's not provided at the moment, but with the next Docker Java version, it will be provided, so we'll pull that in. The other one, as far as I know, simply calls off to Docker on the pretty much on the command line, like a shell, so you cannot actually run Docker uh, from your local machine, and then uh, you cannot run your build from a local machine and then call off to a remote machine, so that's simply not possible, whereas mine basically can be configured to simply say, I want to run this locally or on a remote machine. So I think this is more useful because if you look at a build pipeline, you don't necessarily want to install Docker on your Jenkins box or something else. You might want to have a dedicated box for managing images and containers and so on. That's actually something we'll have a look at now as well. And you can see that uh, virtualization can be pretty useful in build pipelines. Um, so we can use these images, which are most of the times then pr production-like, um, to bring up new environments like QA, staging, UAT, production at some point of time. I personally haven't used Docker in production, um, so I can't really give you any experience about that. Uh, maybe you can later on in the talk. Um, you guys are actually using it, um, so that might be helpful. So it should be fairly simple to use virtualization. It's simple to bring them up. And how can this look like in a full build pipeline? Um, so here we see a representative build pipeline that you might have in place. Commit stage, so we say, Compile the code, run unit tests and integration tests, create the artifact at some point of time. When we're done with that, we want to create a new image which also contains the artifact that I just created. And then with that, once we create the image, it's in one repository in a Docker repo, which we then can use and pull to basically bring up new environments uh, as we need it. For example, for automated accept acceptance testing, for manual testing, and finally for production. So let's run through this. So we can first say, at some point of time, commit stage, we create the artifact, and a good practice is to actually put it into a binary repo. So in this case, I'm showing Artifactory, but it could be Nexus or something else. We publish it there, we have it, so we have a track record of all the artifacts that we create. Then at some point of time, when we want to create the the actual image, we can pull that artifact so we know exactly the version that we need. We take that artifact, download it. Uh, we use the Docker tasks provided by the plugin to create a new image. And part of that creation could also mean we built this Docker file on the fly. So we can basically point it to that specific artifact. Uh, we push it to a Docker repository. And then finally, we can pull that image uh, into different environments to so basically bootstrap them, use it there across the board, and we use the same image for all of these environments to run a specific container. Um, and of course, you can pull that uh, image to bring up your own local development environment if you want to. That kind of depends on your use case. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover for today. Um, if you wanted to have a look at the references here, Vagrant and Docker, there are these plugins here as well. Um, and now I would basically be open to more questions. Yeah. Um, in yeah, I think what I would do in your uh, use case. Um, so, oh, the question was, I have a pool of virtual machines, um, and I want to pick one to bring up a specific environment. Um, you could probably do something similar with Vagrant as well, as long as you basically publish your image. So you can publish to a in-house uh, repo or a public repo and then basically pull that virtual machine out of that repo and use it across the board. Is that kind of like what you asked or? Yeah, the virtual machine that we can use for deploying. Uh, so the question was, how can I dynamically determine a range of IP addresses, pick one of them that is free, and then use it to create a new image? Uh, so basically, you could um, write some logic in your build script, which determines a free IP address. Um, that could, re could simply be written in Java. And then when you create the image, you would basically pass this on to your, the, the tooling that basically creates your image. That doesn't have to be vagrant. You might actually use something else. Uh, that's probably the case. And you, then you can basically bake it into the configuration that you need when you create the image and publish that image again uh, to a specific uh, repository.
Does that make sense? That's what I kind of understand. Maybe I misunderstood yeah. your question. Or yeah, that's pretty much part of the vagrant file. So the question was, how do I determine what provision I want to use? For example, if I use vagrant. Um, so you can basically, that's part of your configuration in the vagrant file. You pick a provider. And then from that provider, you basically point it to that specific configuration that you want to use. And that, of course, looks different based on the provider you use. Um, that would lo look different for Puppet, but it also lo would uh, look different for Chef or Salt or something else. Uh, and you can basically arrange your configuration in the same location as your Vagrant file or even point it to something else. So you can basically make it part of the source code of your infrastructure as code. And how you organize that is pretty much up to you. Um, Any more questions? Otherwise, I would say we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs>